Steve, if I start with you, um, you talked about uh, business has changed but the fundamentals are still the same. You spoke about um, placing value on the people you employ. Uh, that's easy to say. It doesn't always happen. I read um, in either the Australian or the Fin Review last week about a survey in which uh, employees said they didn't feel appreciated, they weren't thanked enough. Um, it seems to be a management problem. So how should bosses now be looking at their staff? Obviously as a team, but, but it's not just that, is it? You've got to be considerate. Now you've gone, I, I yes, think you've gone on. straight to the, uh, the heart of the issue here, which is you know, a lot of this is common sense, but why doesn't it happen across workplaces? Why do so many of the surveys indicate that engagement isn't what it should be? And, and that's a, you know, a, a requires a, a lot of reflection now from you know, leaders of organisations to, um, to get their heads around and to, uh, to get commitment to. But at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it's, it's a challenge to really embrace this and decide and take feedback. So a good example would be productivity, hot issue. So what do we do when we talk about productivity in a lot of our organisations? We say, let's cut budgets. Let's find ways to cut costs. And what that is, is a, a pretty negative place to be. There's an alternative approach, and a, an approach that ought to definitely be run at the same time, which is to ask your people what's possible. Ask them with what you have today, how you're performing to the potential of the organisation. And it's amazing what you will find. And I ask organise, organisations this at the top level and at different levels often. And people will line up and say, you know what, we're performing at about 55% of what's possible, if you had to put a number on it with what we have today, not with if you gave me more people and more money. So people in organisations know what is stopping that organisation from being as good as it can be, and 80% of the stuff is about how we work together. So if management asks that question, if organisations are committed to listening to their people, much of the answer to new opportunities and to better efficiencies is there to be had. But, but you're talking about management changing its style, um, and it's not the way we've been conditioned to running a business. So it's a, it's a huge ask to suddenly think of yourself as a manager and think, how's my management style? Maybe I need to change it. That's, that's a really tough call on yourself. Yeah, and, and that's why the solution to this, because I do believe this is probably the, the most significant productivity um, lever. It's also at the heart of why workplaces aren't more innovative, more diverse, more sustainable. All these issues we talk about, we talk about the issue, but we don't get to the heart of it, which is we need to shift management mindset. Therefore, given that the problem is out there, it's not just going to be a quick fix. We need to look at things like integrated reporting, the move away from pure financial reporting into giving shareholders and stakeholders insights into how organisations manage the other aspects of their business. More and more organisations um, using engagement surveys so that management gets feedback. Um, more and more organisations putting a value on people management. Now there's one for you. There is no profession more important to our economy than people management. Yet, it's something that we get to do without often the right motivation and the right training. And I think we have to stop that. We have to acknowledge that people who manage people have a significant responsibility for those people and their effectiveness at work. And we need to raise our expectations of managers of people raise the capabilities we expect of people before we give them those responsibilities. So it's systemic. There's a whole range of things from reporting through to skills, through to um, surveys and feedback that we're going to have to institute around workplaces. And this is where, in a sense, workplace relations and the discussion about workplace relations should not be limited to IR. IR is part of the discussion, but let's be honest, 90% of it is not about the employment contract, it's about the day-to-day -day relationship between people at work and the people um, they work with. Okay. Teresa, you said um, cloud computing was a, was a terrific investment, a, an ideal tool for small business to use. Um, I read uh, this week that the US government um, is trying to cut its massive IT budget and they are looking at using cloud computing and it will save them $3 billion a year if they move to this. However, I'm still not quite sure 
what cloud computing is. And I have a feeling a lot of you might be the same way. Could you explain it a bit more for those of us who are not quite as technical as you are? Okay. Well, look, I, there'll be many people more uh, IT literate in the room than me, but what cloud computing basically is, is instead of, um, well, just imagine that you wanted to get, um, could be sales reporting, it could be um, mining your customer database, it, it could be marketing campaigns, and you could just go through a web browser and actually get access to all the different applications easily, straightforwardly, and that, that could live, it wouldn't live in a, in, a, in a physical environment. So, for example, there are some case studies in New Zealand of how firms that were shifting in this direction did much better in the Christchurch earthquake because their, their information wasn't sitting at one repository that actually was disabled. So it's a, it's a conceptual thing. It's a, it's, what, what happened is that PCs came along and in the beginning they were actually straight, reasonably straightforward to use. But they became, it became more complex, it became more and more applications, the PCs got more and more interconnected and that actually added complexity and what cloud computing does is it takes away a lot of that complexity. It basically says, l rather than just add and add and add to what we already had, if you started with a blank bit of paper, how would you design it? Well, you design it this way, with a simple web interface. I mean, just a, a, a little example of you know, some of the shifts that are taking place is I, I don't, I, I use an HTC smartphone and I don't tend to, sometimes people ask to borrow it to make a call. And I say, well, you might not be able to work it because it's totally touch screen. It's a totally touch screen phone. And that's because I've gone totally touch screen, iPad, phone, everything. And that, that you know, the, the, the first generation interface with PCs is hard work. Do you remember some people's joy when they went onto, went onto Macs, away from the PC environment? I mean, they, it's a very first generation interface that actually is not intuitive, it's not easy, and where IT is going is a shift away to that, it's a shift to, um, it's a shift to touch screen, it's a shift to um, the information sitting in a cloud which you can access from anywhere to do anything and not all si sitting in separate applications in you know, different physical layers. I'm not sure I still understand. <laughs> <laughs> However, I might return to that in one moment. We'll just move to Brad. Um, I'm really eager to learn. I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, I suppose it's because I come from a journalistic background and, and I find the jargon sometimes that's used um, in technology a, a bit baffling. It's a bit like lawyer talk, you know? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a language all of your own. But Brad, 50% uh, of Australian companies don't have websites. Now, why do you think that is? Um, I'd really love to know the answer to it. I, do you I think it's because they're confused, they don't understand the lingo? I think that's a big part of the problem. I think that the technology industry you know, I actually started off as, a, as an engineer and was quite bad at it and decided journalism was as far away from engineering as I could get. And now, well, now I, I, write I started off in journalism and thought it was really good and never wanted to be an engineer, but go on. Now, now I actually write about engineers, which is obviously my penance for some crime that I've committed. But, um, and I think we have. We've confused people because we've invented terms and, and this industry thrives on reinventing itself every few, few years. So we had mainframe and then we had minis and then we had client server and then we had the internet and now we have cloud. And, it's hard to keep up with this stuff. And I think if, if we from the technology space don't start speaking English, um, we're going to leave a lot of people behind. And I think that's what's happened. I think for many small businesses, they've got a lot of issues around the fact that they're worried about making payroll next month, not about investing in a website. They've mm. got other concerns. And it's not necessarily that easy. And a lot of them also don't know where to start. Mm. Um, for those of us who are, are not digital natives, and I, you know, at 38, I didn't have a, a web address on my first business card. Um, and most people out in this room, many of you wouldn't, anyone over 35 or so probably hasn't. We didn't grow up with this stuff. It's not second nature and we don't know where to begin. And I think it's really incumbent on a, so we can't leave it to somebody else to do this for us. We've got to start asking questions ourselves. And there are tools and resources out there and it's as simple as, as getting a PC, jumping on, typing something into Google and just reading and learning. Which you is know how they really have an English going. thesaurus that you can go to when you want to check a word. Oh, there I is think a what we need is a little thing that, so when you see a thing like cloud, you can go up there and say, cloud, look up. There and is then it th could tell you what it is. There is a dictionary of computing out there if you go into a bookstore, and we do still have bookstores, thankfully. Um, 
you can probably buy one. I'm sure there's probably an iPhone app that will tell you as well. So, but, but seriously, ask your kids. Read up, learn. Just start somewhere simple and build your knowledge up. Okay, well, we talked about PCs. Um, Hewlett Packard is trying to get rid of its PCs because it sees the future as, as, uh, as tablets and, uh, and even though they're the worldwide leader in PCs. So are PCs are on their course? Is that, are they coming to the end? Well, actually, HP got rid of its tablet business as well. They're, they're really getting they're out of the... they're going back into it again, aren't they? Uh, the touchpads are on sale at Harvey Norman for $99 now. So I think that... that no uh, free commercials here, please, Brad. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Jerry needs a bit of help at the moment, so... Um, if only he'd sell them online, he'd be all right. Well, there you go. <laughs> Hewlett-Packard's, I guess, it's changing its business strategy. Hewlett-Packard's really focusing, I think, more on the, the big end of town, so the enterprise consulting type work. And, and what we really see, though, is that it's becoming very hard for a lot of organisations to compete at the, the device end because of Chinese manufacturing coming in and doing things, things cheaper and more effectively. You've also got a dominant player like Apple and you've got um, Google coming in with its Android platform. So it's, it's made it difficult for some of the more traditional companies to be able to compete in that space. We've seen IBM do this already. It was a good number of years ago now that IBM actually sold off its PC division. This is the company that invented the PC mm, mm. and sold it to Lenovo. And I think you'll see a lot of businesses changing and adapting. And I think it's it's a smart strategy at times for a company to realise it can't do everything that it used to do because business ain't what it used to be. What I wondered, and you might like to comment here, Steve, but all of you have a comment. What I wondered was, um, it seems to me that when you choose an, an iPad, for instance, it's a very personal choice. So I'm wondering if we're going to reach a stage where people take their own iPads to the office and uh, businesses are not going to have to supply computers, which is a big saving for business. Is that where it's going? I think that's happening already. Yeah. I just On Brad's point, I just want to just pick up one mm. thing, which is that the point I was trying to make was that business owners and managers are so busy in it that they don't step back and think about change enough. And that the time you spend in doing that is often seen as a once in a year event or a waste of time. And what Brad's saying is you've got to take the time to think about how technology can change how you go about doing what you're doing and therefore have a positive impact on the what people are doing. And so unless people step back from their day-to-day -day responsibilities as managers and clear the air to think about change, think about the future, and go against the instinct we all have to not do that because we're so busy, they won't get the time to think about technology. And it's a false economy because the time you take to do that stuff is actually going to produce a better return than the time you're spending head down doing what you've traditionally been doing. So I think it's a big, that's mm. the big pull here. Mm. There are, there are schools in New Zealand now that require children to come with iPads, basically. You know, that's what's required. So that's, the, that's where we're going. And the next shift is going to be even more interactive. I had lunch recently with a New Yorker, and she's developing software such that, at the moment, you can read media online or read a hard copy. So, you know, but you can read the Fin Review or read it online. It's still the same experience. It's still quite passive. And what she's doing is developing software that would enable you, if you say you're reading something, to, to interact with the media, to actually send a petition to someone that you're reading about or, or to actually do things online that respond to the content that you're seeing immediately other than just Oh, politicians transact. would love that, wouldn't they? <laughs> oh, you can't wait. That, that <laughs> momentum is unstoppable, I think. That, mm. that the, the internet started out being a sort of a, a, a more passive thing. It's increasingly become interactive and that will carry on. Okay, so... Um, People running a small business. Let's look at some of the things that are available. We've got Skype and we've got Twitter and we've got Facebook. We've got the internet. I mean, well, uh, which Should they have them all? Can they use? Is Facebook good for your business? Is Twitter? Can you use? Would that be good for a small business? I think you need to try everything. Um, and I think you certainly need to investigate everything. I don't think that every tool is going to be suitable mm. for every business. Now, we were talking about Twitter a moment ago and, and Steve made the point that if you're building a brand... Um, Twitter's great because you can communicate directly with the people that follow you. And I think, Ida, you've joined in the last this week. This week, I'm virgin Twitter. Wearer. No, I'm, I joined this week. I've got more than 5,000 followers. I'm I, I've been on it for three years and I've got less than half that. So, <laughs> you know. but I don't know what to do with them all now. You're supposed to tweet every day. And sometimes I haven't got time. <laughs> You've got time. Um, <laughs> but you need to try things and, and try a blog. See if it works for you. Because until you've tried it, you won't actually understand the power that it has. If you've not tried Skype, give it a go. It gives you free phone calls between Skype users and can cut your international phone bills. Well, there the thing about Skype that I think maybe isn't used enough myself is that you could use it for conferences and stop flying hither and yon. 
Absolutely, and don't mm. tell anyone from the airline industry that. <laughs> Um, you've got that. And then there are dozens of others that you may not have even heard of. There's an interesting one called Shoeboxed, and what they will do is, you know, you've got that pile of business cards on your desk that one day you're going to put them into Outlook. Yes. Put it in an envelope, send them to Shoeboxed, they'll put them all in and then send the, send the contact details back to you. Oh, they'll I like that. They'll do it for that. your receipts as well. So there are, there are dozens Isn't of different tools good? out there. Yeah. <laughs> but until you start looking for them, you'll never find them. Hmm. What about you, Teresa? Um, look, I, I, I agree with that. And uh, also picking up Brad's advice from his uh, speech about, you know, go to your kids to find out what's coming next. I mean, go to your younger employees because they will be using all these tools, sometimes on your time, sometimes on their own time. And you might be able to turn that into, you know, productivity gains for, for business. Okay, two quick questions because we need to continue on. Um, privacy. I, I think the Rupert Murdoch News of the World um, phone hacking scandal showed us that it's easier to hack people's mobiles and get into their voicemail. Um, I'm wondering if, if we use privacy enough, whether we actually put the controls on. I mean, I don't think that I ever use a pin when I'm going into my mailbox. I, do we? I will now, now that I've told you. I mean, but do people, do people uh, observe these rules enough, do you think? It's pretty easy to get into a phone, isn't it? Look, uh... <laughs> We need to know in this. The, in the tech industry, you know, privacy is one of those things that's a bit of a downer. To, well, to it's a big problem for Facebook, isn't it? Mm. But the, look, the interesting thing is that um, it's a big, big issue, but there's no question that people, whilst when we talk about it in this forum it's a huge issue, individually we don't act like it is mm. because there's so much evidence to show that people don't take the necessary steps. They don't update their passwords, they use their birth dates, they use their kids' and dogs' names as passwords. I mean... So, so, in a sense, what that says is that privacy is a bigger issue in this context than it is for individuals, and that's also been proven with the adoption of online banking and everything else, which a few years back you'll all remember people saying, well, no one will do it because, you know, privacy is an issue. So I, I think that your message is a good one, which is use the PIN, change your passwords and treat it seriously. Um, but I, I think that's an overrated threat to the adoption of online services and always has been. That's... And yeah. what about this new phenomenon I've read about social media burnout? People are in overload. Um, you know, we become techno, techno beings. Uh, have you met anybody with this kind of burnout, um, Brad? No, I'm sure they're out there. It's, but it's coming from America, I can I, tell you now. But, but <laughs> social media burnout, it's interesting. It, it's something that sometimes the media likes to grab onto to ideas because we think their time has come. And I don't know whether the time for social media burnout has come or not. I don't know how real that is. Sounds like a good book. Hang on, it was, TV, it? It was, <laughs> it was TV when I was a kid. Then yep. it was, when I was at university, it was um, those computer games, remember Space Invaders? Mm -hmm. And then it was PC games. And now it's um, social media, and the truth is... It's only, never, because of the compelling, only because of the compelling nature of it now, you know, like Twitter, like Facebook, where people are always feeling the need to go online, say something, post a photo, whatever. But it, it's like many things. There are some things that just aren't suitable to some people. I know I have friends who don't own a TV. Um, they're in the minority, but they had telly and they decided there was nothing on worth watching, so they got rid of their television. People will go through different phases, and, and there's nothing forcing us down these paths. We need to understand that, that, you know, there are changes happening. We need to acknowledge them, but we still have control over the choices that we make ourselves. And if we're choosing not to embrace social media, we probably have a damn good reason for it, and therefore we should be allowed to make that choice. Okay, one, one final question. Um, the NBN, the National Broadband Network, how do, we, how do we all feel about that? Is that a good idea? Will it be obsolete before it's finished? Uh, it will not be obsolete before it's finished. I can shoot that one down now. Um, and it, yes, my degree never got completed in engineering, but I, I got enough of a whiff there to know what's happening. Um, I think the NBN represents a game changer in Australia. It's an accelerant. It takes what's been happening for the last 15 years and raises everyone up to an equal level. So we no longer have people that have poor connections and can't get connections or on dial-up or what have you. The MBN, in tandem with mobile communications technology, it, it tears down barriers of geography once again. We can get access to whatever we want, wherever we want it. And it, it creates sufficient bandwidth that although perhaps many of the things that we'll use the, the MBN for in 10 years' time may not exist today, the history of the development of the internet has shown us that as soon as you give people more computing power and more bandwidth, they'll find a reason to use it. You agree with I can that? Well, Sorry. just to, to finish, I can guarantee there's no one in this room that's using the same computer they were using 10 years ago. So we always find reason to upgrade.
Mm -hmm. Steve? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Brad completely, but I, I think it's also important to remember there's plenty of bandwidth out there today that's not being used fully. So it comes back to it's not about the technology, and similarly with social networks. Unless you've really thought through who your stakeholders are, who your customers are, what their expectations are, what your relevance as an organisation is, and done it well, whatever you do using Facebook or Twitter or online is not going to be successful. It's a, an extension, and it just puts more more pressure on organisations to be much, much more clear about their relevance to their audience and their relevance to their customers. And so once you've identified that in a business sense, then you can leverage all this wonderful technology to reach those audiences in a more effective way, in a more complete way. And Teresa? Look, I think technology historically has been very disruptive and no one, perhaps except perhaps Steve Jobs, has predicted the next wave, the next shift. And I just think it's actually too early to know whether the MBN is hugely foresightful or going to be a white elephant. I just think it's too early to make that call. Well, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Uh, would you please thank our guest speakers, Brad Howarth, Teresa Gatton, and Steve Vamos. Thank you very much, all of you.